Welcome to this rebroadcast featuring Chris Shea of Life's Journey Life Coaching and author Lisa DeLay. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. I'm going to put our, our thing on record here and send out a tweet on this. Um, let's see. I'll say join or chat or something. I don't okay. know. Let's see if I can probably not even spell it properly. Let's see. Um, okay. And so I'm going to be mostly asking questions and deferring to you, Chris, because I've witnessed plenty of codependent relationships. I've been in a couple and, and tried to extricate myself from several. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they're the kind of thing that you don't, it tends to be at least that you, can end up being in them and then you're like, oh man, here I am. (laughs) One of these situations where I can see that we're getting into this rut of this Mm -hmm. rules where I feel like I need to be needed and the person wants to be helpless or or whatever. And we can get more into what, (laughs) excuse me, what those things can look like. But oftentimes it seems like we find ourselves in relationships that aren't super healthy uh, um, you know, it's like, oops, this doesn't seem good anymore. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm recording this and hopefully this will be a resource for people. And, and you who are listening and watching can pass this on to people, you know, who might be struggling with a codependent relationship, or if you ever get in one or wonder if you're in one in the future now or in the future, um, codependent relationship can just be so life sucking and keep you so trapped that I felt like this is something that if you haven't been in one or at least a little bit, uh, you probably either will be in one or you will know somebody who's in one because it's just so common. We we're social (laughs) creatures and we want to help. Most of us want to help people. Excuse me. And so we, we extend ourselves and we help people because we're, we want to be good. We want to be helpful. And there's something wrong with that. But in the process of doing that, sometimes we wind up linking up with people that are just not good for us and who might take advantage even unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, what, what, uh, but not a better time to do this than to ask you, Chris, who have actually dealt with this in a clinical setting uh, as a professional and could maybe shed some light on it. And, uh, and then Rhiannon's here for when my brain goes, and she's she just has such a knack for keeping the conversation going and asking such excellent questions i knew i would need always need backup i always need always need backup so i'm really happy to join in we do well together so i'm I'm pleased that uh all of us are here (laughs) yeah absolutely so but I, I definitely would encourage people to, you know, join in with their comments and their experiences. Um, you know, we can talk from the clinical side and things that I've experienced, but it's also important to hear from people what they've experienced and what they're going through. Um, you know, and maybe some things that they've learned, you know, of, of how do they as quickly as possible, identify the codependent relationship and, and how soon can you get out of a codependent type relationship? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So I guess to get started, what, what maybe we can, I'm trying, trying to figure out the best way to, to kick this off. Um, I guess when, one of the things I'm really curious about, Chris, when, when people come in to see you, they might not even realize that they're in a codependent relationship that kind of can be, something they discover later, (coughs) excuse me, forgive me. Um, And that in talking to you, maybe they realize, and and you can, you can obviously correct me when, when you want to and and tell me how it really is in real life. (laughs) But I would just guess that people come in to talk to you about their problem. And then you realize that maybe uh, some authority figure in their life, maybe a a mother or father um, has this sort of stranglehold on their life or maybe a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something uh, there want you wind up hearing about mm-hmm. just how a mesh they are with someone else and then it, it'll maybe come up again and again and then then you're maybe getting a sign that oh well their life is actually tied in with a person that might not be very good for them or maybe is holding them back or maybe they don't realize and so how do you tend to see this unfold for people 
And, and that's very true. I, I can off top of my head, think of a time that I've had somebody come to me directly and say, I'm a codependent, I need help. I, I don't think that ever happened. And for the majority of people, when I've mentioned to them the possibility of a codependent type relationship, there's usually that quick pushback, you know, but I'm the one who's okay, I'm just helping. So, I think it's important to just have the caveat from the get-go that people who are codependent need to understand that this is really not in any way a put down to them mm -hmm. because they are doing the best that they can in trying to help make either another person's life better or the family's life better. So I think that's that's an important thing to note. You know, they're, they're not trying to do harm in, in any way whatsoever. But the problem is the more that they keep doing what they're doing is going to lead to harm. Mm. So typically what I've seen was in where most of my career, a couple decades, has been dealing with people with addictions, drugs, and alcohol. That's where you saw a lot of the codependent relationships. Mm. Is, you know, During our family program, when you would bring in families, significant others, people close in, in their relationship who then we can either discover they're in a codependent relationship or the more we're educating them on how to, in a healthy way, deal with the person who is suffering from the addiction, then they start to realize, you know, well, maybe I haven't been doing it in a healthy way. Hmm. But today, um, I would say more and more we've dealt with codependency, not just in the addiction field. You know, it started that way. That's that's where it came out of mainly from uh, the group of the um, children of uh, uh, adult children of alcoholics, uh, the ACOA group. And there are a lot of good authors who really got the word out of what is a codependent, what is an adult child of an alcoholic. And then that grew into what about some of the other substances? And now today we can really use that term for people dealing with anyone that they have to help out on, on either a mental health issue or even a medical issue, mm -hmm. you know, is now into that codependent. So, you know, anyone listening to this who, you know, can drop out and say, well, you know, I don't know anybody who uses or is an alcoholic, so that can't be me. Well, it doesn't have to be that, you know. Do you know somebody who needs your help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've also seen it in um, in marriages that are uh, like a parent-child marriage, if if you will. Uh, there's a there's a either either the husband is um, sort of like treats the wife. <coughs> excuse me. This this would be a, a heterosexual relationship that I've seen where. The husband treats the wife sort of like a child that needs to be cared for is very paternal and you, know, you you kind of like your silly girl um i have to take care of you or you're gonna who knows what will happen to you or the opposite where the, the wife is is kind of bossy and domineering and um you know oh if i don't check all the finances you'll just make us broke and and in a way you would you would first think like how does it how did why doesn't one of them stand up to the other one or why doesn't you, you think that there's a problem, but then you realize they actually both kind of like it like that mm -hmm. because it keeps going on and going on. You, you would think like, why don't you stand up for yourself? And it's not so simple because they've gotten used to being like that. The one likes being the naughty child and the other one likes to be like the punishing parent. And, um, and then it's, then you realize, Oh, this is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more going on mm -hmm. than what you think. You think the, you think, you know, on the, on the outset, you might think, Oh, the bossy parent spouse, that's the one who's so wrong. And then you realize, wait a minute, uh, the, the child spouse actually gets to get away with it by playing dumb and playing foolish. And oh wait, what's going on here? Like the the there's like a reverse. So so it's it's complicated, and people get in these relationships and they think this is kind of working. You know, mm -hmm. it's not perfect, but I don't want to be alone. And and you wind up seeing and not every not every codependent relationship is like so horrible it should break up. There's little there's a spectrum here, um, but 
like what's healthy and mature for both people is to be equals and to and to make the the person the either, even if it's a friendship to to make that person the best version of themselves and and that it's mutually healthy for that you're more free because you know that person than less mm -hmm. free you know and i think it's like a calling <clears throat> excuse me a calling for us to be in relationships where the the friend or the spouse or the child or whatever, or the parent mm -hmm. is more free and more themselves and more empowered than less. But sometimes we don't really have a mindfulness and awareness of what we're doing in right. our relationships, you know? Well, and that's usually what you find in generally in relationships, but you know, more focus into the codependency. It's typically not that person going in saying I'm going to be codependent, you know? And, and like I say, they don't come to me for codependency. You know, right. so because as we say, I mean, it starts out fine, you know, that you have a person who is suffering from something. So whether it be an addiction or, or any other mental health issue or medical issue where they need help and assistance. So, you know, be it close friends, be it family, spouse, whatever, are going to do what they can to help them out. But as you say, Lisa, the more we would get help the more we rely on that help. Yeah. And it becomes that kind of vicious cycle that is, it doesn't mean to. And, and, and I also don't want to disparage the person with the condition who needs the help. Right. Because in, in all cases, it's not that person who decides consciously, I'm going to take advantage of this helper. Right. But it just becomes, you know, the more that a person is willing to help me, and the more it's making my life easier and better, then in most cases, why wouldn't I want them to keep doing that? And yeah. maybe in some ways, even unconsciously, push the limits. How far can I go and what they're going to do for me and help me because that's less I have to do and I get used to it. So I don't see this in most cases as people consciously either taking advantage or on the flip side, trying to put their whole life in, in entirety into somebody else and lose their own. There's always exceptions. Oh, you, um, Rhiannon, and I want you to jump in when you have a question. Yeah. But oh, I, I, I just, do you have a question? I, I did, but go ahead real quick. I wrote it down. <laughs> I have notes too. Don't worry, Rand. <laughs> the, one, the one thing that came to mind real quickly is: Do you think that the people who need, who feel codependent, kind of find each other? Like the opposites attract, like that. Like a a, a person who's needy finds a person who's, <coughs> excuse me, who's who's a giver finds a needy person. Do you think that those those matches sort of find each other? And you have you noticed that people are drawn like? they'll move from one codependent relationship to, to like another one and they'll move and, on to. Yeah. And it can also on studies have shown run through generations of families. Oh, okay. So when you look at what you were just mentioning, Lisa, I, I think you would find it more so on the person who is the codependent, the one who is the helper, they will more than likely find themselves in multiple situations where they are going to become taken advantage of and they're going to end up losing themselves for the other. And a lot of that happens because that's what they've learned. When you look at, you know, learned behavior, one of our experiences in life taught us for those who've grown up in families where they witnessed a person being codependent and they figured that's what you do ends up losing themselves, has no sense of who they are, their self-esteem goes down. And as they go on with their life, they don't really have a sense of self. So they have to lock into somebody else's sense of self. Mm, okay. So typically you're going to find that more in the codependent themselves, but in a lot of cases, a healthy person, emotionally healthy person, is not going to latch onto a codependent. And I think that's where you get with those opposites attract because for an emotionally healthy individual, they tend not to like to be doted on like that. 
Oh. And it's going to be like too overwhelming for them, too suffocating. Mm -hmm. And they're probably not going to seek out a codependent or not stay long with a codependent. Mm -hmm. Where those relationships are going to be long is when that codependent finds the person who either mm -hmm. consciously says, ooh, I can take advantage of this one. Or it's that unconscious, yeah, I need help. They're willing to help. And then, you know, we're just right. off and running. Um, actually, this is not the question I had a minute ago. But since I wrote it down, I can wait on that one. <laughs> no, um, I was wondering if you find someone who is in maybe more than one codependent relationship. Say you have um, a family situation where there's a codependency going on and they're trying to distance themselves from that. And in doing so, if they realize that maybe they have a few certain friends or a few certain maybe work scenario or whatever other situations in their life um, that may be bordering on codependency or have some of those same traits. Do you find that that person, when they're trying to break free from one codependent relationship will also distance themselves from others almost <laughs> a mass exodus from all unhealthy activity, you know, <laughs> even, even if it is erring on a little too far on the side of caution. Um, uh, is, yeah. is that something you notice? So that, that's a, a good question, Randon, because, you know, I think what we also have to understand is you know, when people think about codependency, I, I think we look at it in a very narrow focus that it, it's a spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, or, you know, a similar type relationship mm -hmm. without noticing that, True. What if it is a spouse who also has a parent <laughs> who is in need or a friend or whatever that, yeah, they will definitely latch into every relationship that they can in that codependency. The ideal, if we were to treat that person or get them to understand what they're doing would be, as you mentioned, they need to break them all. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just get rid of one and keep you know, one, because I don't think this is one of those things where it's it's a multiple, uh, I don't even know what the word would be. It doesn't multiply exponentially in that sense. Right. You know, so if you have two or three or you have one, really doesn't matter. Right. It, it almost sounds to me like you're trying to say, um, well, if you're an alcoholic, just stay away from vodka, but you can have all the tequila you want. So, you know, yeah. if, if you're if you're trying to get better, you need to. Yeah, you, know, you got to off. break them all off. Mm -hmm. But I, I think one of the things we also have to be aware of, and, and I don't want people to misread that you can learn how to not be a codependent. Mm -hmm. You know, you can learn how to have a healthy relationship. So. If anybody finds themselves in a codependent relationship, I'm not implying that you are going to have to lose that relationship. Right, right. I mean, you may, you know, because what it also shows then is the person who's codependent needs to learn how to not be codependent. And the person who was receiving the codependency needs to learn, you know, a, a healthy way of living in a relationship. If the two can do that, I'm not implying or saying that they have to totally leave each other and split up. Right. But if they can't both do that, then yeah. Well, it's a lot of times, some people are kind of like my way or the highway, but a lot of times, it, especially in, in, um, in family relationships or just in close friendships where people are willing to renegotiate and say, it hasn't worked or it isn't working for me, but I really, really care about this relationship and I don't want it to end. And we just need to, renegotiate stuff because it's not working but yeah. i love you mm -hmm. you know people are willing to to try to make it work because they don't want to lose it all because it matters to them um it might blow up at first or something but it's it's kind of like if if two people are willing to work on something at least at some point mm -hmm. then of course it of course it is workable it's only when one person walks away and never looks back you know and sometimes it doesn't mean it's going to get fixed that month or that year but it, it still can, I, I think there's always a yet on, on right. things, um, as long as we're still breathing. Um, yeah. And that you can, you can renegotiate how you interact with people. And, I, and um, in my interactions with people, as you were saying, um, is in instances where I will meet someone and I tend to connect with people really well, really quickly. And sometimes that attracts uh, people who are used to codependent relationships. Mm. And they'll be like, oh, this feels really nice and familiar, you know. 
Um, but then I will try to do as if need be just boundaries like, oh, well, we can talk now, but we can't talk for five hours, or, you know, or <laughs> we can, we can meet for coffee, but, but you, you know, can't live in my house or whatever, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Where yeah. um, not everybody is going to be able to do that, but because I feel like I went through a season of my life where I was, well, I had a roommate who, who I felt like that was a real problem because we were roommates. We didn't, I didn't have anywhere else to go. And I felt like I was caring for her needs. And at some point I was like, ah, there is no fixing this problem. Mm-hmm. Which wasn't, you know, it was just like the way to fix this problem is to not be roommates. That's, that's how we do this. And, um, and that's how it worked out. But, I had to realize from then on when I was starting to get into this, let me help you, let me help you and be like, okay, we're gonna, I can help you this much. Mm-hmm. And then because I do want to help people, I do care about people very deeply, but I also can't just do that until I'm run dry. Right. And, and I, I think in, in what you're saying is, you know, sometimes we do have to walk away from that, but we don't always have to walk away from that. But I think also we have to look at, and I don't know why this term just hit me when you were talking, but it did. I think there is that line, too, between the, let's say in quotes, healthy codependent versus the unhealthy stalker. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. You should identify, you should, that's a good thing to talk about, like, sort that out yeah. yeah well because for for some reason i'm not saying your roommate was a stalker but for some reason that that image hit me of, of the stalkerish person you know who is, is like always around you or is going to call you all the time and blow up your phone and do all this oh, that, that that's goes beyond <laughs> so again that's, that's why i like to say in, in quotes healthy codependent because again the codependent is trying to help the, the mm-hmm. stalker that's a whole different scenario <laughs> so that the, they just have to get rid of them <laughs> codependent we can work with <laughs> i hope i haven't offended any diagnosed stalkers but <laughs> or recovering stalkers or whatever <laughs> what, what about undiagnosed stalkers because <laughs> oh, that's fine I, <laughs> we can offend the undiagnosed it's not the diagnosed we can offend those <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, yeah, the situation would be if if somebody obviously a stalker is negative, you know, somebody who's trying to help you. It, it's usually, you know, the way I felt like I got sucked in to this relationship that was the most negative, I would say the most enmeshed and most negative relationship that would involved what I would call codependency is that <clears throat> already being friends with somebody I cared about needed my help. And I could help, but then that wasn't really enough, more help than more help than more help. Then it was like, there wasn't any, there wasn't any end in sight and my help didn't do anything to make the person, didn't make her stand up on her own two feet at all. It was just enabling. And that's, that's kind of like an addictive, in an addictive situation, it works really the same way. And I was wondering, at at some point I asked myself, Am I getting something out of helping her that she isn't doing anything herself? And so, you know, then then if I backed off, then it was like, then I was kind of under attack. So mm-hmm. if I backed off of helping, why aren't you helping me? That kind of like, this is what I'm expecting out of you. You know, when she was fully capable of doing whatever it is before. And and it just it just felt like weird and toxic by that point. And I, and I was like, yeah, this isn't this is not working for me. And it wasn't like, it wasn't a mutual friendship where I would feel like it was even like, yeah, maybe she would help me if I was in the same situation, but maybe I was just getting used. Could be. Yeah. I mean, so we're very social creatures and so we need each other Mm -hmm. and we also need to be needed. We, I think there's a certain um, validity of uh, if I don't have someone, if someone doesn't need me, you know, what am I here for? And and then when I need someone, I should be able to ask. And there should be some reciprocal help, give and take. Mm-hmm. And hopefully there will be seasons in a friendship where nobody needs help and you're just having fun and getting to know each other. And, and sometimes, you know, those seasons can get a little out of whack. But 
I, I think overall it should kind of be fairly even. I mean, I'm not talking 50, 50, 50. You don't have to jot down, oh, they needed gas money this week and then they needed a ride to work the next week. And then, you know, but, but you kind of get a sense of they are always needing me. And if I need one little thing, all of a sudden they don't have time for me. But then as soon as, mm-hmm. as, soon as I'm do- living my own life, they need me again. And it's, mm-hmm. it's always out of balance. And, you know, I, I had a friend that, that they were like, oh, no, it, it should be always even. I'm like, well, OK, well, I had a friend that went through a really bad time. And and it was I didn't really enjoy the, them being uh, going through this rough time. But I was glad that I was able to help them. And then later I went through a rough time and they were able to help me. And it didn't seem even at all for a couple of years there, but overall it evened out. Right. So it, it can't be just yeah. exact. 50, 50, mm-hmm. 50 well, and, the, and, the, and I think that's where a lot of the, the codependency sneaks up on some people because as you're saying, we are social creatures and mm-hmm. you know, the vast majority of us want to help somebody else. And, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to help them. Um, and, and I think we don't want to feel used. You know, even, you know, when those thoughts may come in that, oh, I think I'm just being used. Normally we push that aside because we don't want to feel that we're being taken advantage of, because then that might mean that I have to stop helping them and I don't want to stop helping them. You know, where the whole codependency really takes root is when I no longer either notice or care that I'm being used because I've lost all sense of who I am. I've lost the sense of myself and my purpose in life is to make sure that person is doing well or is cared for. And I'll go to any lengths to do that. You know, and, and it really gets in the cases, and I've seen a lot in, in the addiction work that, you know, that's where then you start that enabling and, and the codependency and enabling, I think, go hand in hand, <clears throat> where, again, you enable not to hurt. So you're going to do things that you think are helping, but in the long run aren't helping. So, you know, let, let's just say, you know, you, the husband's drinking definitely alcoholic, you're doing everything you can to help him out. And what you think really is helpful is, well, I will call the job and and just let him know he's sick, you know, instead of the just have him not show up, you know, or get in trouble or call the job and say, look, he's drunk again. I don't know, you know, but I'm going to call and say he's sick again or Mm -hmm. whatever excuse you want to use. Because then the back thought is, well, I'm helping him in the long run because if he loses his job, think about the finances, his reputation, his self-esteem, the family. We can't have that. So if I make up the story, I'm actually helping people. The problem is in making up the story, you don't give that individual the chance to fall down. And if they don't have the chance to fall down, they won't see the need to be picked up. And it's just going to perpetuate and perpetuate. But the codependent and the enabler in this is going to keep doing it at all costs. But then the, mm. the attention and the focus of that entire family is going to be on that person. And it's not just going to be the spouse. It's going to be the kids, possibly the extended family. And that's where a lot of isolation comes in. Because when they become the focus, no matter where that family goes, you know, you, you go out, you go with friends, neighbors. Who are we talking about? Oh, poor so-and-so. Oh, they're not feeling well again. And they're this. It's always about that person. And after a while, extended family and neighbors and friends are like, we're tired of hearing about so-and-so. Mm-hmm. You know, why are we always talking about that person? And, and that isolates. And when they walk away, then what does the codependent say? See, they never really cared, but I'm here. Oh. See, I care. And then the other person will agree. Yeah, you're the only one who gets me. You're the only one who understands me. And by the way, can you call my job tomorrow? Because I know I'm not going in. <laughs> right. You know, and then they will. You know, but again, they're not doing this out of any sense of malice until you realize you're not helping anybody. And in the meantime, you've lost you. Hmm. You is now assumed into the other and you're now isolated. Uh, it's like, and it's like a team. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Um, it's like a team then too. It's like a bonding. It's like a toxic bonding. Like, oh, we're on the same team. And if we're not together spinning this little lie that we're doing, um, oh, I hate that. That's just, just really creepy, but it, it winds up because we're social, it winds up uh, making a tight bond that's going to really hurt both people. And, and if there's any kids in that relationship, then they're learning like, this is how this is how mommy and daddy do it. This is how well, you can do it. Too. Right, because this is how then it becomes generational. Yeah. So, you know, if you grew up with that and, and those, let's just say, you know, for that family unit in, in this example, then that family unit, the children see mom and dad acting that way. Nobody tells the kids that's wrong. They don't see any negative consequences. So when the kids get in a relationship, what are they going to do? The exact same thing they saw the codependent do. Mm. Because they, they saw how it seemed to be helpful. And I'm sure the codependent taught the kids, you should be helpful to everybody. Mm. And loyal. And like, loyal. Uh, and uh, and they never heard anything different. They never saw any negatives because the codependent kept the negatives away. Yeah, it's interesting. Like when we talk about family systems and family rules, I don't know if you if you studied any of the like family system stuff. Mm -hmm. I just did a little bit of that in graduate school, but learning about what are the family rules that like the things we don't talk about that exist, that we all know are the rules or the secrets that we keep in the family. They don't actually get talked about, but everybody kind of knows what they are. Um, the things we don't talk about are the things, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. Every, every family has them. And some of them are, we don't talk about daddy's problem or we don't, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, or we, we stay loyal about this and this is hush hush, but, um, but we're allowed to do this. We're allowed to yell about this, but we're not allowed to talk about this. And there's some really, really interesting things in of family rules that you don't even realize are there sometimes until you get involved in a relationship with someone else in a, in a very close friendship or romantic relationship or whatever. And you get involved with someone else and you're like, oh, well, you didn't do it like that. And mm -hmm. oh, you, they have different weird things. And then your your family rules kind of collide. And then you realize, well, my family was weird. and Your family was weird. And, and then you realize there's some serious junk going on. But you carry it with you until the to the next one for sure. Yeah, and sometimes it never gets resolved uh, until you really bump up against you know some force that's going to try to pull you from that. You're going to keep perpetuating it over the generations. You know, so you either end up having close friends or other family members or a relationship you get into with a healthy you know, emotionally healthy person who starts showing something different, that this isn't what you do, yeah. you're going to perpetuate it because if, if it's not becoming a problem, and even though it is, but you're not acknowledging it as a problem, then you're not going to make the change, you know, and, and that's the whole thing of dysfunctional families, you know, is that keeping the secret, you know, once mm -hmm. a family starts keeping secrets, then that's where you look at it, it's not functioning, that that's the dysfunction, mm -hmm. it's, it's not working if we have to keep a secret from everyone, you know, it's but even like, it's not even, um, it's not even a secret. Like it's not even talked about like that. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. underneath, it's underneath this thing. Um, a woman, I did a podcast on this. If anybody wants to, to hear about it, um, if you go to sparkmymuse.com and look up and just Google family rules or just, or just uh, go to sparkmymuse.com in the search field, Put in family rules. And there is um, Dr. Janet Stoffer, and she studies family systems and teaches on that. And what her family rule was was very strict Mennonite background, mm -hmm. and their family rule was um, grandpa. Great, it was her great grandpa. Great grandpa died from a I kid you not a drunk driving horse and buggy accident because that can happen apparently. Mm -hmm. um, no one said a word about it because of course you. You're, you don't want to be a Mennonite who drinks and a Mennonite who gets a DUI uh, type of related death. Yeah. And so no one said a word and everybody kind of knew about it, but no one said anything. And then it got lost in a generation and then no one would, would talk about him or how he died. And no one knew and her. And then two generations down, she had no clue. And when she started asking, people would say, we don't talk about that. And she'd be like, well, you don't talk about it. Then she started asking and a few people started to squeal. And then she was like, whoa, we had a family secret. We were not allowed to talk about grandpa. We were not allowed to be honest about it. Men and I family who was like very 
Christian and Bible believing, but no one, it was like, shh, we don't talk about it. Like you could just, mm-hmm. he could have been, a, it could have been a teachable moment. Like, okay, maybe don't uh, drink and uh, gallop along. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. know, but it was, it was like so shameful and it was so embarrassing that it, we, they decided to just erase it from like everyone's collective memory. Mm-hmm. But that secret put in to, into the entire family's really large family put into the entire family. We are ashamed and we keep all of the things we're ashamed about really below this. No one's going to know about anything we're ashamed about. So it wasn't just that accident and that sin. It was like anything we're a little ashamed about is a secret it's a secret life and we're not going to say anything. We're pretend it doesn't exist. So it was like a family culture. Right. So it was really, really interesting. As she started digging around becoming mm-hmm. um, a therapist, she was like, Ooh, <laughs> you know, she started digging up some stuff. And she's like, how about, how about now, not, not everybody was willing to do it, but how about we start just talking about what we do as a family? And is this the best thing? Would, would God want us to do this? Right. You know, you know is, this, it- is this healthy? And that makes that difference in, in the families that I had worked with. Um, and, and I say a lot, you know, especially with the addictions, because that's where I saw it the most. But the families who were able to come in to the family portion of the treatment and be totally honest, you know, where the family members age appropriate would know, you know, that whatever family member was in treatment was there for that reason. And the family could talk about it. And, and again, age appropriate with younger kids knew that, you know, dad was ill or mom was ill or whatever. Um, those families always fared well because they were open to talk about it. You know, people knew what was going on. Where the other ones who want to keep that denial and, and that codependency of, you know, well, maybe they don't need the treatment and I was doing fine with them. Why are they here? And, and sometimes entrench more into the codependency if the family member got caught and ended up in treatment, you know, at, at the job or whatever, or got that DWI, you know, and, and then it became, well, I have to try harder, mm. you know, because that's going to get out. You know, we can't let that get out. Mm. Where the other families were, well, maybe it needed to get out. You know, maybe you needed that DWI, hopefully not killing somebody, but, you know, needed that DWI and maybe that public exposure to get you the help that you need. And that usually made for a healthier dialogue. You know, it it helped better. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping with with that honesty. And and I think that also helped the person in, in treatment when they left. Usually I was working in patient facilities. They would stay about a month and then they would you know, transition to other levels of care. But the families with a lot of codependency, even when the person would leave treatment, if it wasn't treated well, the codependent piece, they would fall right back into it. Hmm. You know, there were a number of times. Yeah. They are structured to to support their addiction. Exactly. And and they expected, you know, and they're also center of attention and they expected when you get home. You know, and, and a number of times I, I would have more so the guys. I don't know what that says about guys, but more so the guys. I would have them call me up when they would get home almost angry. And they would say, you know, I got home. There's no banners. There's no balloons. There's no, like, welcome home. Yay, party. Oh. And, and I would sit there on the phone and I would say to them, what did you expect a party for? Mm. It's like, well. I'm clean and sober now. Good. So we want to party because you're doing something you should have always been doing. (laughs) But, you know, that's part of that codependent expectation, you know, that they were the center of attention. They got everything because the rest of the family would fall into that codependent mode. Right. And now the family went through treatment while they were in treatment. The family learned about codependency. The family learned how not to be codependent and enabling. And the family got healthier as the individual was working on their stuff. Then they get home and don't realize, no, family is a little bit healthier too. (laughs) And knowledgeable. They keep doing the same stuff. Right. They're not going to treat you the way that they were. And there is no reason for a party because you walked out of treatment. Oh, man. You know, so I think it it helps on both ends, you know, to to really start with with that honesty and and that talking within family, especially when you're dealing with addictions. 
Hmm. Rhiannon, did you get your original question that you wrote down? I didn't, but I can ask that now. Um, how closely aligned is a codependent relationship with an abusive relationship? And I mean that especially in an emotionally controlling abusive relationship. Does it depend on that intent of malice or hmm. can it sort of evolve into that? Is it just sort of an unintentional manifestation of that kind of a relationship or is it a completely different thing uh, because of the intention? That's a good question. Off the top of my head, I, I would negate what you just said. Is it, you know, is it not even relevant? I, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Is it intentional or non-intentional? I think it's probably in both. You know, I, I think the person who is going to take advantage of the codependent I would probably say there is a little, if not a lot, of emotional abuse going on. Hmm. If the person is unintentionally taking advantage, hmm. just the fact that the person is being taken advantage of, there's probably the emotional abuse. With the difference being, it will probably never be identified as emotional abuse. And the person who was unconsciously taking advantage would probably like have heart failure if they found out that they were being abusive, you know, because they, they, they would be like horrified, you know, like I would never be abusive to, but the fact that you were doing what you were doing is abusive, mm -hmm. you know, and, and definitely I would think on the emotional, the, the sad part is that it's not usually going to be identified because the codependent, has such low self-esteem and such investment in the other, they're probably not even recognizing the emotional abuse. And even probably to the point where if somebody were to point it out, they would say, well, I deserve that. Oh. You know, because I, I should be taking care of that person and, and I maybe slipped up. You know, I didn't do it as well. I didn't, right. I mean, in very hard core cases of, of especially generational codependency, you know, because that. it also there, there was also uh, something you mentioned about pushback as soon as you identify it. And I think that's very similar to um, something a therapist friend of mine said, you know, if, if she sits there with a client and says, OK, the, the relationship you're in is abusive. Your, your husband is treating you this way and that isn't abusive. And the very first thing out of the client's mouth is going to be, oh, no, no, no. And, and be defensive and and, you know, reject that reality to stand up for the relationship, to stand up for mm -hmm. the spouse. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like very similar, um, a very similar echo in codependency. As soon as someone, if someone were to identify this and just say, okay, I'm sorry, but you're in a codependent relationship, there would, you said there'd be that pushback. And so it's something they have to identify themselves, right. you know, and, and, and evolve that acceptance. Yeah. And, and that's where the helper, the counselor, whomever really needs to <laughs> walk around the issue to get that person to identify that they're having the issue. Because exactly any direct you know, mention of you're a codependent, you're in a codependent relationship, whatever, even if they don't fully understand what that means, just the fact you've identified them with something, they're probably going to push back and say, I'm, I'm not whatever you just said I am, <laughs> you know? So yeah, really showing them. I, I had a, a client uh, I don't know, a year ago, a couple of years ago, who was involved in some sexual abuse stuff, but didn't identify it as that. Mm -hmm. And was very defensive. You know, if, if you pointed that out, no, 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 no. The way it, I was able to get them to understand that, and this really came from them, which was nice. They found a news article that had a story similar to theirs, and the news article identified it as abuse. And they brought it in at first to defend. See, this is similar, but see, this isn't me. But the more they read the article, I had them read it out loud to me, Ooh, is when they realized. <laughs> because that's when I said, as you're reading this, how do you feel? Is this? And I was like, well, yeah, this is, this is. Where's the differences? And once you start breaking down, okay, well, here's your story and play, you know, put it here, put it here. Then it becomes, well, wait a minute. Because yeah. her big thing was this article, this person was wrong. They should have never done this. But yes, she was defending the situation she was in. Okay. So 
it, it takes a lot mm -hmm. to get somebody who's really enmeshed in, in some of this to, to come to the realization of what they're doing. And what I found over the years, especially working inpatient, you have the luxury of time. When we brought the families in, uh, they would come in for a weekend, so Friday night to Saturday night. Throughout that, they were getting a lot of academic lectures. The point was, if we present this as academic lecture, defenses are down. Hmm. So in these talks that we would give, it'd be me and the other counselors and all talking to families, we would be talking about characteristics of codependency and what all those look like and all in an academic setting. And it was always the other, the other. Mm. So it was never put as any of you sitting here might be in this. Never said those words. Just here's what this is. So that over that course of the weekend, the more they kept hearing it, some people would start to identify it because their defenses were down. So it's all in how you know we, we can bring it to people and, and approach them. So, Chris, how would you say, oh, I just wanted to say one more thing, Rian, mm -hmm. in, in terms of malice. And I think there's times when people are sort of awake enough, you could say, to know that they're being manipulative. And sometimes they're not. You know, that the people will be like, eh, I might be pushing this a little bit. I might be manipulative. And they'll, they'll have kind of some cognizant. And then I think other times people just are just kind of. And maybe, I don't know, Chris, if you agree with this or not, but that sometimes people are just going along in their, in their nurture or whatever, or their nature, or their nurture, they're just going mm -hmm. along kind of blind, kind of responding and in their, in their way, in their unhealth. And then occasionally they'll be like, ah, that might've been a little manipulative. <laughs> mm, I feel a little bad about that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think it's, I think it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, that on both sides, like, so the person who's the, the helper and the person who's the needy person, I think at times that both people kind of realize what's going on a little bit. And for one reason or another, they're not willing to put a boundary or to stop it or to get out. Uh, and then it's too hard to, to separate that. And it goes on and on. Um, because I think there's, there's fear. There's a lot of fear and change and, and, Mm -hmm. changing a relationship that is unhealthy but kind of working is hard because I know people who have been together in bad relationships for years and years and years and I don't think they can imagine life without the person mm -hmm. and so even though it's not great they're just kind of going along yeah well and and that becomes sometimes a difficulty because for me I then start looking at how do we define and label you know, because academically, as you were just mentioning, Lisa, you can look at a certain family or a couple and think academically they are dysfunctional, they're messed up, they need help. But what I've come to term it as they function in their dysfunction. Hmm. You know, it's working for them and they're not physically abusing each other. Yeah, there might be the emotional abuse, and I don't want to minimize that, mm. but it's working in a weird, because you're right, they'll stand by each other's side, and they will be there through thick and thin, mm. and then you begin to wonder, you know, at what point do the labels maybe not matter, that we need to look at things beyond the labels? I don't know. I just kind of throw that out there because that's one of the things I throw out to my students also, you know, is how do you know when to say this is wrong mm. or this isn't right. Yeah. That's putting a huge judgment, unless you know for sure there's a lot of abuse going on. That's a whole different, and when you're dealing with kids, whole different story, but you know, we're dealing with consenting adults and, and the way that they're operating. And especially when you take in, you know, different generations, you know, mm. who were raised in a whole different way. And they were raised to look at relationships in a whole different way. Mm. I don't know. You know, at what point do you interject and say, we got to do something, you know, or, or at what point do you look at, say, an older generation's codependent relationship and say, well, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Let's make sure the kids understand a healthy relationship. Hmm. You know, when you start parsing certain things to understand where you're doing the greater good and the less harm in a certain sense.
Hmm. And also, like, if it's a situation where, let's say, let's say it's um, an engaged couple or something like that, where the person isn't tied to this person yet, and there's something kind of not going right, or it's, a, it's, there's still time, and the one, maybe the one person thinks, I got to get out of here, you know, and the other person is clueless. Well, if, if one of the people is feeling like this is terrible, this is not working, that's your, that's the answer right there. Oh, yeah. That, so, that's a clear, yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> it's, it's not like, I wonder if this should be okay. It's like, if somebody is, is feeling like this is toxic, this is not working, I'm dying here. It's a, to me, that's a no brainer. That, that's kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, it's like not worth, um, if things feel toxic, then they probably are. Yeah. So, and, and it becomes difficult, you know, when you're talking about marriages or long term relationships, but also those family bonds. When you, you know, begin to realize, you know, maybe you grew up in that and, and that was your norm. And now as you're aging, you're realizing I grew up in this codependent relationship and that was my parents or that was my grandparents or whomever. How do you set those boundaries? You know, are, are you never going to talk to them again? Are you going to change the boundaries? Are you going to try to change them? You know, the, there, there's a lot of gray when you're looking at how do you deal with family? Because it's harder to just walk away from family. You know, I, I can walk away from my, you know, engagement. I can walk away from friends. But do I just walk away from family because this is what they're doing? <coughs> What I don't do have an answer to that question. <laughs> how, how do you handle um, getting out of a codependent relationship, it, or can you handle it, without specifically having a conversation about boundaries? Say the person, mm. you, say you have a vested interest in this person, you have a long history, um, you love them, but you just need to reorganize, you know, exactly how enmeshed you are. And and they don't react well to change and they don't re react well to boundaries, especially, mm -hmm. you know, I will have this much time for you, but no more. So is there a way you can do that without having those conversations with certain people? Because, you know, like mm -hmm. you had said before, if if you if I were to if someone were to tell that person, you know, hey, th we are in a codependent relationship and this isn't working for me. So you have to behave along this list of rules or I'm gone. You know, that mm -hmm. person would be like, oh, my gosh, I've hurt you. I'm so sorry. And and it would totally flip everything on its head mm -hmm. and you wouldn't really get anywhere because mm -hmm. you'd be so tied up with, I didn't mean to hurt you, you know? So, right. so can you have a, can you heal a relationship? Can you reorganize the codependency into mm -hmm. a healthy, healthy, mutual, um, helpful relationship without having both teams mm -hmm. on board, so to speak? Mm -hmm. I believe you can, in, in theory, you can. And, and I do like that, that, distinction that you're making in, in that, and I think it's true in relationships in general, you know, honesty is a number one important. Uh, I'm not going to minimize Definitely. that piece, except for if it's going to be done where it's only going to hurt them. Mm. Like there is going to be no helpful reason for somebody to know something at all in any way, you know, and I think this would be one of those cases, you know, like you say, if, if they if they came to the realization that they were inadvertently hurting a person that they loved and this was going to emotionally destroy them. Why tell them, you know, if, hmm. if you want to stay with them and you want to make this work, why do you want to emotionally hurt them to, to what end? So I think it would work in those situations if you're dealing with an individual who unconsciously was going along with the codependency hmm. if that codependent understands now what they were going through and they can understand the education behind it the setting the boundaries the keeping the boundaries knowing how to self-care because that's important again you know build up your own self-esteem understand that you are a person separate from the other so can you begin to create a life of your own friends, your own hobbies, maybe your own job, whatever it may be, that you can create the sense of self and the boundaries without that person knowing why you're doing what you're doing or just to say to them, I need to do this for me, yeah. which also is not a lie. 
Because right. that's what a codependent needs to do. They, they need to do this for themselves. You're just not saying I'm doing it because I need to and you're the one who, <laughs> you know. But You're not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know. You're at fault. I need to do this because of you. No, but, you know, I'm doing this to make myself healthy and good and, you know, I write some books or whatever, so I'm going to do this. And then possibly, too, you know, if, if this person really does love you and, and really wants to be with you, you invite them along, you know, at, at certain times. You know, so maybe you got involved in some club and they're having, you know, a, a social or something. It's like, hey, you want to come and meet some people I've been going out with. You can start to get them into what is that healthy relationship. I also believe that within family structures and families, however you define family. So don't just think, I don't think traditional, I use that word, I'm just using the word. Right. Whatever that structure is, when you change one person in that structure, you have changed the entire dynamic. Mm -hmm. Hopefully for the better. Not always, but <laughs> hopefully for the better. So that's why I, I answer that, that in theory, that if the one is really changing and the other really was unconsciously going along, in theory, you change one variable, the other should start to change in response. Mm -hmm. In theory. Hopefully for the best. <laughs> Hopefully for the best. Hopefully for the best and not latching on to the next person in an ultra needy situation. And right. Now, like, now, you know, the, the you know, wife thing. or husband won't help me, so I go to the kids. You know, who's the next kid who's going to be the one that's going to because they've abandoned me? Yeah, you know. Yeah. I don't think it would also work in somebody who's doing it consciously. You know, that that's not because they're not going to let you go out on your own. They're not going to let you have the boundaries and the separation where you're going to probably in those cases say we need to at least separate and here's why hmm. you know, well, I've been a codependent and you've been abusing that <laughs> and we need to separate for a while. <laughs> you know, I think that's when it needs to just be laid out, you know, for what it is. Well, Chris, because we, we, we're at nine o'clock, but I want to continue if we can. Are you able to continue past nine? Yeah, for a little bit. Okay. I thought maybe we could really drill down into, because what we did here was, it seems like more people are joining us at nine. Hi, everybody who's new. Um, <laughs> everybody likes the nine o'clock part. <laughs> nine o'clock part is like, hey, let's go on lab. But I'm glad you're all here. I, what I was hoping for, Chris, is a little bit of like, maybe from the notes you wrote down is that what are some of the signs if we actually drill down into really specifics like what are some of the signs exactly like what the what the title says like what are some of the signs that we know we're in codependent relationships i'm sure we're all in some spectrum somewhere yeah. with someone um because let me tell you my kids feel really codependent but i'm, I'm going to excuse that right now um and then and then how to be free in in some of those ways because i think drilling into some really specifics it might be wise people are tuning in to hear that and this has been really really enlightening i'm i'm so glad we've done this blab and mm -hmm. I'm so, so glad that both of you have have been um with me on this and that we've been doing this i'm, I'm really appreciative of, of both of you i think it's gone really well but just for anybody who um I don't know that we actually got to like real signs, although we've been talking, we've been actually talking right. about them the whole time, but not right. actually enumerating them. No, we, we could get all like academic like and, you know, start making lists and formal definitions. And I have my notes. We can do that. Um, but yeah, but that, that may not be bad because, you know, we, we have been talking in a lot of generalities, which I also think is important, you know, because, I think for most of us, when we talk about anything in life, when you're looking at, you know, what is normal and not normal, what is functional, dysfunctional, and, and any of those terms, I do believe there there's gradients with those. You know, we can identify, you know, a, a dysfunctional family, but I've always looked at it on the opposite and said, but can we really identify a totally functional family? Hmm. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but again, I think in a gradient, you know, there's some families who are a little less on the dysfunction, some a little more on the dysfunction. So, you know, we shift back and forth on, on a line. I'm good with that, you know. Um, 
or normal abnormal. You know, well, who's normal? <laughs> Normal's overrated, and I don't really believe it exists. It's all exactly. <laughs> Which goes back to my line. We're somewhere back and forth on the line. <laughs> you know, and, you know, so, um, but, yeah, some of the things, though, you know, if we want to get into, like, lists and all that of, of that I wrote down, um, let's see, for codependence, um, so some of the things, and I think we've touched on most of these, but typically codependents will have low self-esteem. They'll look for anything outside of themselves to make them feel better instead of an inward look. Uh, they have good intentions in what they're doing. So they're usually not doing any of this out of malice. Mm. Um, codependents often take on a martyr's role. And um, that's where we had talked about, as this one article looked at, is like pulling the strings. You know, I said, you know, you call in for like your husband's job or something and, mm -hmm. you know, make something up. So um, that's where they call it becoming the, the benefactor uh, mm -hmm. of that. Um, and uh, let's see. Because it leads us into a dysfunctional family unit in the sense that a dysfunctional family doesn't acknowledge problems exist. So if we just use that as what makes it dysfunctional, again, with caveat, there's my line. Um, then what will happen is they won't talk about anything that's confrontational to them. Oh. Um, they will disregard their own needs. So in disregarding their own needs. Um, it's all about the other. <laughs> They'll detach themselves. Uh, they will deny, ignore, and avoid emotions, hmm. especially difficult ones. Um, they won't talk much, just in normal conversation. Hmm. And hmm. a lot of physical touch and trust don't happen. Hmm. So they won't trust other people because it's one of the things that they've kind of learned throughout the, the family time that people will lie to you and people will get things over on you. And, wow. but, but at the same time, but see, I can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. So even a codependent coming from a, what we call that dysfunctional family huh. might even recognize what's going on, but I, I can't talk about it wow. because I learned you don't talk about this stuff. So even if I'm with a counselor, I'm not going to talk about it because we don't talk about this. Wow. It just stays bottled up. <sighs> so what gives them permission to finally, like what breaks the wall down? What gives them permission to finally talk about it? Usually something big has to happen. Mm. So either something that they no longer can hide or control okay. or over time, somebody just really, keeping the pressure on them of, of what's going on and, and continuing to show where is the break in the reality? Yeah. You know, so if somebody keeps saying to their friend, I'm not a codependent because this, and then you hit them with, yeah, but the person did this. Uh, you know, well, what about no, but what like, about, yeah. right? You know, you're, you're showing the, these inconsistencies in, in their speech and, and after a while, mm -hmm they might begin to break through that wall and start to say, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, but when you get to that point, all those other stuff comes in that I was just mentioning about, you know, we ignore those feelings. We don't talk about those feelings. Yeah. We, you know, it's not about me anymore. It's about the other. It's, you got to break those walls as well. And it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, that, that's not, now, in my experience, a lot of them, the trigger point really was the fact that their loved one got into treatment. You know, when for whatever reason, a loved one is going away for a month of intensive treatment is a lot to trigger. But again, not so much trigger, I'm a codependent. It just triggers just something big in the family. And then when they go to the family sessions, they start understanding what that means. They see their role. Exactly. Oh, So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've seen this happen, too, with... This is a little different because it is different with parents and kids, but I've seen, I've seen, I'm going to try not to pick on women too much here, but I've seen the instances time and again of women who their kids were their life. 
their kids go off to college and they kind of fall apart and a couple of bad things can happen. There's been a few routes I've seen happen there. Um, but that it was kind of like, it wasn't, it was a kind of codependency. I mean, there's, you're a parent and you're supposed to care for your kids and everything. But the whole thing was like, it was a little bit of a martyr thing. It was a little bit of like, I'm going to deny myself. And you could see these traits kind of filter down. Maybe it was a generational thing or whatever. But you got the sense that it was so sacrificial, self-sacrificial. that When the parents, when the, when the kids finally leave, uh, there isn't much self left. And then there's a lot of trauma when there isn't anyone to care for it. So you see manipulation going on of, I don't know, maybe making the kids feel guilty, maybe maybe boomeranging them back to the house somehow or whatever, um, or all kinds of different um, things can happen as repercussions. But I've seen it quite a lot uh, um, and, and to different ends. But, mm -hmm. but the, the crisis comes when the kids leave and it's like, oh, who am I? And I, you know, they don't, they're not sensing that that was a big part of their life needing to be needed. It was a huge, huge deal. They didn't realize how much of their self was sort of taken in, up in that. Right. And, and that's, that is a variant of the codependency because you're giving up your life, giving of your life and not in the sacrificial, but in, in that, as you're saying, you know, my life doesn't exist. It's all about the, it's all about the kids. You know, and, and as much as parents do need to sacrifice for their kids and protect the kids and, and all that, the goal of raising kids, and this is going to sound bad, but I'll go for it. The goal of raising kids is so they leave. Yeah, push them out of that nest. Just get out of yeah. Nest. I mean, look at nature. You know, no, no other, you know, creature in nature. <laughs> You know, sits there and is like, oh, let's just keep the young one. You know, the <laughs> point uh, of raising young is to prepare them to be your own. You know, find yourself. <laughs> you know, um, and, and I know it sounds bad and it's after nine, but... <laughs> But in that true sense, you know, I, I think that's that's where it comes down to. So, yeah, when, when you get, you know, those parents who, you know, live for their children and then the children walk away, uh, that's that's where you have, you know, those issues. Yeah. But I think that's also where the growth can come in if the people are open to it. You know, because one of the other things that would hit those families when their loved one would go off to treatment was not just that they were off a of treatment, but now they were living in a house minus that person who was the focus. Yeah, big gap. So, right, just by removing that can begin to shift the dynamic, mm. but maybe help somebody to understand, look what I've been doing all day. You know, when they realize that next day when that person isn't there, like, what do I do today? Mm. Oh, yeah. That could start triggering some things that they need to, you know, that they start realizing, wait a minute, I've been putting all this. And then they go to the family session and hear about codependency. I think that's where a lot of that begins to click. Yeah. Like, yeah. The role. Yeah, that, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like you don't realize that you're sort of doing addiction together. Mm -hmm. but, you, but you really are because the whole family kind of participates in how it happens. But it seems like the one well, person has the problem, but... Everybody is sort of working on it as a team. Well, and I wrote down this uh, thing. I'm, I'm looking at my notes, and unfortunately, I didn't write down where I got it, but they called it, which I thought was really good. Uh, codependency was called a relationship addiction. Oh, mm. very, that's good. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That, that gave me a moment of pause because I, I really hadn't heard of it in those terms as a relationship mm -hmm. addiction. Well, yeah. That sounds yeah. spot on. I should have wrote down my source, but <laughs> I'm not claiming I'm not claiming it was me. I didn't come up with that. <laughs> so I'm not plagiarizing. <laughs> I do have to power up the laptop again though. Yeah, I just had to plug in mine too. I've got like a fifty minute window and then I and then my computer's like <laughs> Yeah, my desktop has no choice but to be plugged in. 
Oh, fine, be that way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I may not have AC, but I never have to run around for a power cord. It's always it's always connected. Well, <laughs> all that I will say in response to that, I would rather look for the power cord and live with the AC. <laughs> I know, right? If you have to pay. <laughs> <coughs> Hopefully next year I will have both, but whatever. <laughs> we live in hope. Yeah, no, in in reference to uh, your kids should leave statement, I was watching a show the other night, and I won't say what show. It's I'm a few seasons behind, so no one's going to be like, oh, spoilers, but I won't say <laughs> what show. <laughs> anyway, I was watching this show and this woman had been raised in really horrible circumstances, um, set back in like the 50s. Uh, and she just she didn't have friends. She was used by her father um, in in many ways as a, well, sort of as a, a benefit package for the people around him. That's the best mm -hmm. way I got gotcha. it. Anyway, gotcha. she winds up having a baby. And one of the first things she says to this baby is, I've never really had friends, but now I have a friend for life. And part of me was like, oh, my gosh, this is heartbreaking because this poor girl. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, that poor child is going to have to be raised with this burden on her head of I'm my mom's first best friend. You know? I know, and that's right? just that that's quite a, a burden to put on a child. And so, of course, it's a TV show, but still. There's, mm -hmm. I, I know that that happens in real life. I know that it. Oh, it does. Oh, yeah. It does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does. That's, that's this, kind this of my, that was my, I won't name names. They'll, they'll never, they'll never <laughs> leave me and, and it'll, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, but in, in a couple, of, <laughs> unfortunately, in, in a couple of the instances of, of where I'm kind of aware with, uh, of that, although not to the extreme that you're saying about, mm -hmm. you know, the benefits right. and all, but, um, where, because that's how the child was raised from birth, mm -hmm. the child became very spoiled and didn't see that as the negative. And like I say, you know, that's a big burden to carry that I'm my mom's best friend. And, and I think that can come with insight. But mm -hmm. for a couple that I'm thinking of, that insight doesn't exist because this is how life is. Mm -hmm. You know, mom does for me. And that's just what it is. And if mom won't do for me, I'm going to throw a tantrum. And even though I'm an adult now, I'm still going to do it because that's all I know. Mm -hmm. You know, so there isn't that insight into, you know, how bad is this or, you know, the burden. And again, the mother's not going to back down because... Well, you know, that's what she's always wanted. She doesn't want to lose the daughter in that sense. Right. It's only when that, that child wants a, a different sort of life because that mm -hmm. was one of my experiences in, in college with one of my roommates too. And, and moving in as a freshman, I was so ready to spread my wings at, and I was like, yeehaw, you know, I get, I get to be on my own. And my roommate's mom would call and she'd, she'd be crying on the phone and my roommate would be gone. She was so happy to be away from home and out of, off, out from under her parents' thumb. And she'd say, she'd be crying she's my best friend. She's my best friend. And, and I was thinking, well, maybe you should get some friends your age. Um, because that's weird. And, you know, she, it was, it was really like, you know, your, your daughter is like having the time of her life. Cause she's in college and she's in all these clubs and she's having a ball. She's going to parties. Mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. was living wild because she did not want her mom to be her best friend. But she kept calling, and, and she I don't know why she always got me on the phone. And I said, well, she's having a lot of fun. I know. I think I'm going to come and visit her. I said, that's, that's not a good idea. <laughs> not, well, oh, unless you're bringing idea. money. I was like, if you're bringing money, that's a good idea. Like, it's probably not going to see stuff you like if you, if you come up. But um, <laughs> but it was like she she was really not ready to let her go, and – she was hoping she was going to commute to school so that she would still have her there. But mm -hmm. this was one of those situations where if she could have kept her there and kept her as her best friend, she would have. But right. The daughter was like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go, you know, find a party mm -hmm. with my friend as fast as I possibly can. So, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, you know, that's a part of a codependency. And that's also where it's good to, you know, make that difference. You know, again, when I talk about that line where we are, because, 
you know, when parents have a child going off to college, you're going to be sad and upset and there might be tears yeah for a day or so <laughs> and then it turns long, over it might be more like two weeks a month i don't i'm really, really sad I'm also, hey, whatever I'm really happy. also really happy it's different for the mom than the dad generally but <laughs> but yeah i mean when we're talking on that line you know, is you know if they're already like a year off at college and you're still calling up in, in full-blown tears you know and the, yeah, we, well, we've got more of an issue. We're just I, I, trying to figure out ways to get them back, like tricks or like little gimmicks to get them back. Like, you know, figuring out, oh, we, we're having problems at home, like little fake emergencies to get her back. Mm -hmm. mm, it was weird. You know, you don't, not that's good. not yeah. good. Yeah. Not I, good. Had a, I had a friend and we were driving one day and her daughter called. So she picks up the phone and she's like, oh, yeah, how is everything? And all I really knew about her daughter, because we were just this is early in our friendship. And all I really knew about her daughter is she had run off to join the Army Reserves. Hmm. And so I'm thinking, OK, my friend's going to be kind of sad because her daughter made the sudden decision and moved away. And it was all, you know, whatever. And she's like, oh, so how's how's boot camp and how's this and how's everything? And And she was just really positive about it. And I'm listening to what I could hear of this conversation going, okay, that's kind of cool. And then um, or she's like, so what are you going to choose? And I, I didn't quite hear all of it. So she put it on speaker and her daughter's like, well, I have this choice. I can go this route and, and it's really safe and predictable and all this stuff, or I can learn to jump out of airplanes. And her mom literally, I was in there in the car with her and her mom's like, okay, your age, you're not married, you're not a mother yet. You want to jump out of airplanes, now is the time to go for it. And I'm sitting there in the car like, oh my gosh, you just said that to your child. <laughs> because that's not the kind of parenting I ever saw uh, modeled in my life. But she was like, yeah, go be a kid, go do your thing, go take chances. And I mean, of course she wanted her daughter to be safe, but she was so encouraging. Find yourself, have fun. This is your adventure, go live it. And that I was just blown away mm -hmm. because I'd never seen someone parent in such an encouraging manner. Now yeah. it might be a little too encouraging. I don't know. <laughs> but it was it was such a stark contrast to anything else I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. so it was, it was and, it, and if only more people would learn to act in, in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and to be encouraging because it wasn't like the person was saying, you know, I, I just want to be like a cliff diver or something. You know, I mean this was a, a valid, you know, mm -hmm. vocation in life, you know, and, uh, but yeah, to, to help people understand because we all are individuals, you know, I mean, granted we're together in society and in our family units, but we're still individuals and to encourage each other in our individuality and, and to encourage us to continue that individuality, mm -hmm. that's really where the healthy emotional growth mm -hmm happens you know and, and that keeps those good lines of communication you know where i'll bet that mother and daughter communicated very well yeah. you know that because that daughter knew you know mom gets it and if mom says no it's probably really for a good reason that is no right. you know so i i think that's where those healthy bonds come in that it's, it's not that we don't need the parent but we need the parent when we need those times of encouragement and questioning. Um, that, that's an awesome story. <laughs> yeah. So kind of the anti-codependent one. <laughs> <laughs> we need one, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in terms of if people have been listening and they think I'm definitely in, I'm definitely in a codependent relationship, but I don't, I don't know what to do without blowing it up. I don't know what to, I don't know what the first step is. I don't know. Not sure how to get free from it or to take make a first move. Or I mean, what do you suggest, Chris? I mean, if you're coming to the realization that you may be a codependent and you're in that situation, I would talk to other family and friends and look for calling a therapist just to you know bounce off you know these I, thoughts that you're having you know to go to to them and say you know i i think i am and, and here's why mm. and then seek 
that guidance, you know, of how to do that so that it can be done in a healthy way. You know, because we also like, you know, we were saying earlier, we, we don't need to just break, you know, these relationships, you know, that you don't like wake up one day and realize I'm codependent, so I'm leaving you. You know, how do we in a healthy way come to a healthy relationship? And and I would say if you're starting to understand that, definitely talk to people that you're comfortable with and to a therapist. And I'm not saying you need counseling. I'm just saying if you talk to a therapist who can objectively bounce something back off at you and say, you know, yeah, you're on the right path or no, you're not. Um, you know, and a counselor might even say, if you have this much self-awareness, let me give you a book to, you know, read. Mm -hmm. You know, so for people who are like, you know, fearful, you know, I don't want to go to a counselor and I want to be in therapy. And I, you know, I maybe not. Mm -hmm. If you're already self-reflective, you just need a push in a certain direction and you might be fine to move in that direction. Mm. Yeah, I mean, even as a counselor, I'm, I'm not one to put people in counseling just because. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend any resources or books that come to mind as, as helpful? Actually, there, there's one, I, I like to say it's a oldie, but goodie. Um, and I still use it in my uh, uh, college class, but the title is when helping you is hurting me. Oh, and it's written by uh, Carmen Berry. Now, the original was published in 1988, and I hate to say that's an oldie. Um, there was an updated version. I still like the original. That's just my bias. You know, so if you, if you want to go on Amazon or whatever and get the updated version of that book, feel free. Um, I like the original. But um, the whole point of, of Carmen Berry's uh, book is about the messiah trap you know a feeling that we need to be the savior we need to solve the person's problems we need to all this to our detriment mm. and actually one of the quotes and, and i wrote this down this is one of my favorites where she writes in there don't rescue others from their legitimate suffering mm. That's I think that, that's very powerful. That's yeah, yeah. Oh, Don't man. rescue others from their legitimate suffering. I know. Don't don't you want to? <laughs> that's like the advice I could ever take. Oh yeah, oh, all the helpers. Anybody listening to this now or later? Any helper hearing that's gonna cringe. Like, mm, 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 what, what do you don't mean? Let them suffer? <laughs> Don't help people. <laughs> That's a dumb book. <laughs> That's a stupid book. What is he saying? <laughs> but um, I, I like to, I, I do throw that out as kind of a shock value to my students. And, and it's interesting to get, you know, people who are in their 20s, you know, kind of looking at that. And then you get all these different reactions, you know. But most of it is, what do you mean suffering? What we're, we're supposed to suffer? Um, which I think says something about our generational culture. But um I also wrote down, and, and I use this, actually, this is the very last slide that I use in, in my semester class. The very last thing my students get out of me is a, a C.S. Lewis quote. And I don't know which work this is from. I got to do my research, but it's C.S. Lewis. He wrote, it's like when a mother allows a small child to walk on its own instead of holding it by her hand. She knows it may fall but learning to walk on one's own is worth a few falls. Mm -hmm. I think that goes into legitimate suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, the kid may fall and bang, you know, their knees, arms, whatever. The kid's going to cry. The kid's going to want the parent to pick them up because it's easier to be carried everywhere. Yeah. But if you let them cry it out, you let them get a little scrape, they're going to learn to walk. Well, and you see that in nature, where um, anything is hatching from an egg or a butterfly coming out of its cocoon, if it does that itself, there's a strengthening process mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. naturally occurs. Whereas if you try to help it along, if you try to break those open and remove its its struggle, then it's it's not yeah. as strong. I've heard it can really damage. It can be too weak to survive the, the animal. Yeah. Right. You know, it's similar. You know, when the the birds will kick the the babies out of the nest. You know, the ones that can fly fly, and the ones that don't don't. You know, and then you can look at that and go like, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> but 
I'm sorry, Lisa's face. Oh, I know. And, and that's why I just stopped talking because I'm looking at her face like, why? <laughs> I didn't know that's how it worked. I thought they all flew. Yes, Lisa, they all fly. Yes. Yes, they all fly. So they kick down and they don't fly? They all fly. They all live. The raccoons never get them. The hawks never get them. Everything's great. They all sing. They all go around and dance and sing and rainbows and butterflies. Yeah. You're messed up, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> a little bit messed up. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, some of them get kicked out too early because they don't have any feathers. They're like they got they got shoved out accidentally, and you're like, that's not a bird yet. That's accidentally <laughs> not enough room in the nest. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yes, Randon, the accidentally. <laughs> accidentally. I mean, honestly, I'm. I was an only child for 10 years. So when my brother came along, like two months old, aren't we done with him yet? <laughs> All he does is scream. Like, seriously, can't he go away? <laughs> I was a great 10 year old. Just, <laughs> Push him out. Push him out of the nest. He's done. He's ready to fly. He's two years old. He can fly. Yeah, yeah he can play in the yard by himself. You know, it's, it's good. <laughs> No. See, this is why I quote C.S. Lewis and I don't use my own quotes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, yeah, it's it's something, it, even if we're just aware of, the, the quote about suffering is really, oh, that, that's, that's, it's really true, but, but like anybody who, even as a parent or, or anything like that, I mean, you don't want people to like legitimately like like suffer unto death or something oh, like that. But as far as, but as far as like suffering, um, like it's like watching your kids struggle. You don't want them to, but the kids who struggle and fail do better than the kids who haven't struggled mm -hmm. and failed. Like the ones who just succeed and succeed and succeed, they do terrible in the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really hard to watch your kids struggle and fail. Like it, because yeah. you, you're rooting for them, you know, you're rooting for them and you see them and they're like, they're trying and they're trying and they're trying and they fall on their face. And it's really, really mm -hmm. hard to watch. Well, um, and that's where that legitimate suffering in a sense. And, and I think suffering might be that that's, I think, where it gets us because suffering, it really implies something deep and big, you know, but I, I think in, in any of those discomforts in life, you know, that right. like, like soccer is my sport. Love soccer. Played it, coached it. <laughs> But I just, one of the reasons I stopped coaching in the rec league with the kids is when they got to the point where, you know, well, teams can't lose and everybody's going to get the trophy because we don't want to hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, I get it on some level, but on another level, if it were my team that got slaughtered 20 to nothing, yeah, we're going to feel bad. But I hope that encourages us to really try harder and kick butt next time. Yeah, you know, to it's me that's a teachable moment. They can walk away in tears. They can walk away in whatever, but that's where you know parents can use that as that teachable moment that you're not always going to win. You're not always going to be on top. Yeah. And yeah. how do you cope with feeling this way? And then what do you do about it? It teaches sportsmanship too. Like you, there has to be a loser. How are you going to respond? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to hate? Are you going to hate the other team now? Or are you going to say good job? I remember. You know, I remember being in travel team soccer too, and we, you'd always slap hands and be good game, yeah. good game, good game. Some of the kids would be like, "Good game," yeah. and you'd like try to do that to your hand, you know. But like, sportsmanship is a really mm -hmm. important thing to learn. Like, you're not going to win every time. Right. It's pride, you know, and, and and you can still be gracious mm -hmm. when you lose, and and then you're going to say, "Go over." Well, how, why did we lose? Let's let's go over that. Could we improve in any areas? Right. And then that's so helpful for life. And and also, I think helps the winning team. You know, if you blow a team yeah. away, like say twenty nothing, you know, with, with the kids, yeah, you don't go and be all up about that, and you know, put them down, and you know, no, you need to say good team. game to them, you know, and it just happened that we played a better one, but we also have to learn the humility that next week's team might do the same to us. Yeah. So you know, I think in both ways we we can learn these lessons, and to me, that's where I like. Carmen Berry's quote, because to me, that's that legitimate suffering. That's mm -hmm. those are those moments when sometimes we can't take it away from somebody and we probably shouldn't, you know, and I think even when you look at people in grief, 
you know, you can be there for them. No. We can't take it away from them. Mm-hmm. And, and we yeah, should, that, you, you know, they, they need to go through yeah. the grief, but not necessarily <laughs> alone. You know, I mean, you're there for them. You let them know you're there. But we also have to step back at some point and say, but I can't take that away. And I really shouldn't take that away yeah. from them. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't, even if you tried it, you, you couldn't. Like, even if you, let's say you uh, tried to be funny or something and you tried to make them laugh, it would work for a couple seconds. Or if you gave them a beer, it would work for a couple more seconds. Minutes, whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever, your trick, whatever the trick is, they still go back to their real suffering yeah. mm-hmm. later. It doesn't actually work, whatever it is, right. whatever you're attempting to do. And that's why I think that legitimate suffering you know, comes in that, that there are some times that people are going to go through uncomfortable things and we really can't do anything about it. And, you know, a yeah. codependent is not going to know how to handle that situation, you know, but in, in that healthy way, you know, we can sit back and it's going to make us feel, uh, you know, all these negative feelings about maybe even my own worth, you know, of, you know well, why can't I help them? Well, why can't I fix this? You know, but then that becomes a lesson for us. You know, we, we can't fix yeah. everybody and everything. And so what do I learn from that knowledge, you know, that helps me to grow? Mm. And what are they learning through whatever they're going through that's going to help them to grow? And if we look at them as growth experiences, you know, the, these legitimate suffering times are really what's going to make us, you know, better people, healthier people in, in the long run. Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe we should wrap it up there now that we've now that we've broken the ninety minute barrier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this has been really, really enlightening. I don't know if we should. It's been interesting. Yeah, I um, definitely uh, gained a lot by listening, and and um, and I think you know, as you were saying about not what what what's the quote again exactly about the suffering? Oh, the. Um... And I'll even put it onto the comments over here, but it's don't rescue others from their legitimate suffering. Don't rescue others from their legitimate suffering. Put on a suffering. comment. It's going to come out bold or um, in caps. I'm not yelling at everybody, but in my <laughs> notes, if it's in caps, I could see it better. <laughs> so I'm not yelling at all of us here. Don't rescue <laughs> others from their legitimate suffering. But, um, but if you know, I was I'm realizing that p- other people's suffering and are un- being uncomfortable with it tells us so much about us yeah. than it does about them. So they're suffering, and we're like, "Whoa, I, that's not okay. I have to, f- I have to fix that." Who does that tell us about? Yep. That tells us about us. Yeah, exactly. Like, I currently can't handle other people not suffering. It is a, a messiah kind of complex. Mm-hmm. Like, do I have God? Do I really think I can? stop this person from suffering yep. i can't stop anybody from suffering i could maybe be there with them oh exactly that's that's, that's, that's about yeah you know i, I think it's saddest when somebody doesn't have somebody and they suffer alone yeah but that is different you know i can be there either physically mm-hmm. or even just to let them know you know all you have to do is text me call me whatever and i'm there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's not them alone. Even if they're physically alone, they know I'm serious, you know. Right. But you're right. There's, we can't do a thing about it. It's not like we can't fix it. We we can show up. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. But the idea that, yeah, there's a fix, there's a fix here. Like if someone passes away or if somebody is, has cancer and, like, unless we have the serum to fix it all, like, there really isn't anything, but there's something in our head that that says, that I don't know, for me, not in terms of, like, a spiritual direction situation, but in terms of, like, my angst about it, thinking, I want to, f- I, I want them to not feel bad, I want them to not suffer, I want to, I want to mm-hmm. fix this and make it, make them feel better, my angst should tell me something about me, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, so... Excuse yeah, me. Suffering, suffering is never fun. Mm-hmm. Challenges that we face aren't like, oh, yes, this is a party. I'm going to get the crap beat out of me. But, you know, life does that to us so we can learn and so we can grow. And and we have to become the person that we're supposed to become. And we, we learn skills to do that through challenges, through suffering. And if we're in a codependent relationship where someone's always fixing those moments, or if 
we're fixing those moments for someone else, then we don't, we're, we aren't truly individuals. We aren't truly learning and growing through our life. You know, mm. whether you step into <clears throat> suffering on behalf of someone else, you're claiming an identity that isn't yours. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're taking on ramifications of a mistake that they made that they need to learn from. So they're not going to learn. So 10 years down the road, nothing's going to have changed in your relationship and neither of you will be better off as individual human mm -hmm. beings for that. Yeah. And we're as soon not, as we take it on learning. somebody else, we're not being true to who we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, you were denying them a chance to learn something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're denying ourselves a chance to learn something too. Yeah. So, well, Awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. So for anybody, it looks like there's even more people than when I looked last time, but for anybody who's interested in, in following us, we'll, we'll do this again next month. We'll figure out a time in August, a, another Sunday mm -hmm. at eight o'clock Eastern standard time. And we'll get together for another thing, which will be a surprise because we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> so <laughs> something along, maybe along these lines of, um, you know, noticing something in your life that needs to be noticed and fixed or, you know, attended to. And if you have some ideas, follow me on Twitter or Rhiannon or Chris and shoot something our way if you have an idea, because we're, mm -hmm. we will uh, take those things into consideration. But it's been really fun to chat with the two of you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everyone, for coming along the ride. Coming yeah. along on the ride. <laughs> it's been wonderful as always. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me. It's always fun, interesting, and educational. Yes. Yeah. This will be available for replay. I will, I will send you the replay, Chris. Mm -hmm. the, this, it, it'll be available on this, but I'll also send you the files and everything like that yeah. to, to repurpose. So Appreciate that. Right. Excellent. All right, everybody. All right, so I guess this is good night. Right. And uh, bye. Good week. See you, everyone. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. <laughs>